Okay, pause. Let's get some backstory. My name is Matthew Hutchinson. I'm Larika Scarborough. And I'm Shanique Francis. And we're here at the Mustard Seeds Community's Jacob's Ladder. We're here to film a documentary to bring about awareness for the lack of support and neglect faced by disabled adults of our Jamaican society. But before we go any further, let's go back to the very start of our journey. This is Still I Rise, Life Beyond Disabilities. Our first course of action was to get a tour of the property to truly understand what life is like at the home, what they need to maintain it, and how they have sustained themselves so far. Katie and Drake, the assistant administrator, took us on an in-depth tour of the compound introducing us to persons vital to the running of the home, like the housekeeping manager who you are seeing right now, and further went on to showing us essentially every corner of the property. This began with the kitchen where we were able to see the preparation for the day's meals and we were able to witness the heart, soul and love poured into every meal prepared by the chefs. Miss Drake was also nice enough to give us some insight on some of the more important parts of the property. So, our mission of, um, as Mrs. Perkins mentioned, most of what we do, we depend on donations from persons all over. So we have a mission um, trip. We have mission trips from the states every year. They've been coming for over 12 years. We have groups coming in every week um, from December to about July, August. And so they come here to do various um, construction work. So they help us build the cottages. We have therapy groups that come and work directly with the residents, medical groups, um, groups that come and do ass ass um, assessments of the residents, groups that work on the farm. And while they're here, this is where they stay. So the house accommodates 26 persons. They have two living rooms. It's a dormitory kind of setting. And there's a laundry room, um, kitchen, you name it. So they stay here for the week while they work with us and actually they pay to come here. So whatever they pay us, that's what pay our salaries by food, clothing, you name it. So that's children and we have some of our residents who assist in various departments. Some of them get a stipend at the end of the month. So Sheldon actually is assisting with the kitchen today. So he's taking up pots and pans, um, dinner plates from the cottages to the kitchen. And we encourage them to do such, to build the self-esteem and they don't feel like they're at home.
So this is our chapel, the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary. We call it the Cathedral of Mosserti Communities, as this is the largest of all the chapels in all the 14 Mosserti homes across Jamaica. This chapel is a donation from a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Rata, out of the United States. Now, this couple has never been to Jamaica. They've heard about mustard seed, wanted to do a contribution. So this was their contribution, the entire funding of the construction um, of the chapel. And this was constructed and opened in 2012. So it's open every day from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And this is where we have our morning prayers at 8 a.m. Our staff and residents, we have um, reading of the rosary during the week, midday. We also do stations of the cross, as you can see them on the wall. Um, so that is done during Lent. And the stations of the cross, as you see, you can notice the African theme. So we have two homes in Africa, one in Nicaragua, one in um, Malawi, so those were done in Nicaragua, so you see the African theme. Um, the pews, these were disposed of from an old church in the States and they were shipped down. Some of them were actually put to fit in the containers. The two um, signs on the wall, thank you Lord, and there you'll find it in all Muslim seed homes, chapels, and these were done by a woman. So this is our baptismal pool. As you know, most of the communities is Catholic based. So most of our residents, they are Catholic. We don't force them. So those are cognitive of making their own decisions. We encourage them. We don't force them. So we have baptisms um, at least twice a year. Our last was in May. We had about 15 residents getting baptized. So usually the pool is cleaned out and filled up if we're having baptisms which is usually done on a first Sunday of a month where all the 13 homes, all the 13 homes will come here. We have the baptism. The mass is usually celebrated by our international director, Father Garvey Augustini. And then we have a feast afterwards. Feast and fellowship with the other residents from other homes. Our columbarium, um, so that's, as Mrs. Perkins mentioned, this is the final home for our residents. So while others will be transferred across the communities, in, internally in most of these, this is where they'll live out their lives. So once they're here, they have no real school. No family, well, some have family will visit once a year or so. This is where they are. So they'll live out their lives, they'll die here, and they'll be buried there. So the columbarium, once the residents have passed to the mustard seed, the body is cremated, and the urn is placed inside of the columbarium. So there are openings, so the urn is placed inside. So we have three more cottages here. This is our external missions cottage. So with the mission group, there is usually a group leader or a chaperone, and one group can um, obtain may contain between 12 to 15 persons. If they are excess, they'll stay on this side. Um, so this is our mission cottage for the mission team. So once the, the mission reps are here, which are internal staff who oversee the mission group for the week that they're here. So we have a security, a mission rep, and a driver. And this is where they'll stay. And this additional cottage, if there's a priest, a deacon, any member of a clergy with a U.S. visiting mission team, they'll stay here for the week. So we have multiple and this house was given the name because it does very well in comparison to the other three. We have Canada House, so this is a donation from the Canadian High Commission. 
we had a house here that was destroyed totally in Hurricane Sandy in 2012. So this was the Canadian Fire Commission of Downingston to replace that house. We have a few strawberries. These are trials. These reaped over maybe two dozen from them. See? Because you know it needs cooler temperature. Money is cool somewhat, but in recent months it's very hot. So we reaped a few in the summer. As you can see, they planted it on the outside where the water can fall onto the cabbage. So this house just started um, bearing everything from this house. And we have tomatoes in that house. So that's out of the city and this is named after our um, international director, Father Garden. And then this is the garden of Eden. This is empty right now. So we have our nursery there with tomatoes, so they'll plant them in Garden of Eden once they're ready. And then that's their well, Moses' well. So it's basically just runoff rainwater, untreated. They have a little pump out. The water is pumped into the tank, and the tanks they add the fertilizers accordingly. And at the root of every plant is a drip irrigation system. So they turn on the pump, I think it's every 15 minutes, to irrigate the plant. The church and the farm were some of the major stops on our tour throughout the community, but we were also able to visit many other places. One of which was the Care Plus Center of Excellence, which is a popular known donation from the Dussel Foundation. Here residents are encouraged to express themselves through activities such as art. We were taken to many of what they referred to as villages, each of which had clusters of resident homes and administrative buildings. Many of the resident homes take on the names of or names requested by their donors, such as St. Teresa of Calcutta Home, St. Andrew Apostle Home, St. Apostle's Love Continues, and Samuel's House. We also got to visit the laundry room and got to see firsthand some of the challenges faced by the laundry staff. Some of the other buildings we visited were the assistant matrons and supervisor's office, which also serves as a salon and lunch room. Matron's office and supervisor office. So this is Miss McLean, she's one of the supervisors. Hi. So that happens too, that's every Matlin's board. Here is the, this is Joseph, he is one of our functioning residents. He works at the gate with the security. This long kit, the assistant matron. But this is the Okay, so this was our salon slash lunch room. <laughs> <laughs> So this is where some of the grooming is done of the girls and the males as well. So Miss McLean is starting up medication. As I mentioned, majority, 90% are on psychotic drugs or other form of medicine. St. Luke's Clinic with Matron Finley Palmer. And this is where, as Mr. Perkins mentioned, we have uh, mental health, a doctor and a psychiatrist coming in once or twice a month to administer intravenous medications for those who take by monthly or monthly injections. Finally, the 5-2, which is a community cafeteria and snack shop. So this is the 5-2, and this is where we get our meals. Staff, as you can see, we are far off from the main. So the 5-2 provides breakfast, lunch, and snack, snacks and juice. And we can credit it, and at the end of the month, this is deducted from our salaries or if you wish to pay. And it's fairly reasonable. Um, it's less than half of what you'll get. You'll pay for externally. So, across the hill there, um, that's our proposed area for our special needs stadium. So, as you know, yes, it, it will have wheelchair tracks. Um, court for where the wheelchairs can be volleyball or basketball, um, other little like snap, snap shots, snap shops um, for the items that they create at Care Plus. So there'll be areas where they can sell those stuff. Um, it will be like because, as I mentioned, they have nowhere else to go apart from if we have beach days or special outings for them so it will be sort of an area to take them out you know they are they have special days in it. so we've come to the end of our tour of the beautiful property of Jacob Sadder
We were able to get interviews with the residents, and while most of them weren't able to express themselves fully because of their disabilities, they were still able to explain to us that they would love to have more of certain luxuries, such as clothing. Another big request was that they wanted more fun activities and events, such as those which they currently have at Christmas time. It was truly heartwarming and humbling to see how genuinely happy all the residents were despite their situations. Homes like Jacob's Ladder provide solace for these disadvantaged individuals, and the care they provide for them is unmatched. It was easy to see that the residents felt the same. When asked if they enjoyed life at Jacob's Ladder, they were quick to answer yes. They credited the caretakers for taking good care of them and providing them with a home. There can be many misconceptions about whether persons with disabilities can be productive workers, but at Jacob's Ladder, those who can work for a stipend as a way to establish an active daily routine. Here we have Mark, who works in the canteen. We watched as he diligently closed up shop, cleaning dishes and more before we went to speak with him. He made it clear that he loves to work and that he loves the life he's been able to create at Jacob's Ladder. Many of the workers who are vital in the day-to-day -day operations of the home also had their piece to share as we questioned them about their roles at the home. Jenny, I'm a laundress. I'm Diolette. I'm a laundry. Okay. Our, our, our duty here is to come in the morning. We work on shift anyway. I come in 8 o'clock, but you have a another lady, she come in at 7 and she's starting duty. So when we come, we start to hang out because sometimes we leave over clothes to hang out. So we started to hang out. Then we take up dry and fold pack the bags, if you see the bags inside here, and send them to each dance. I'm here five years now. Yeah, I'm here three years now. Yes? Yeah. Is it pay my rent, pay all my bills? Mm -hmm. So I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes we get, well, normally they pee. So we will get pee, pee and pieces in clothes. But if it stay bad, we always, because normally the caregivers do it, do, do that job. But if it's not Leave too it. bad, we'll do it. So yes, so far, hand. so yes, so we use our hands at times. When they're well dirty. <laughs> yeah, that's the dirty, dirty one we use our hand and use the brush to rub out the dirt. Oh, we will need a dryer. That will help us. Not uh, um, like when we have rain. Because normally when we have heavy rain, you see that thing there? It don't dry the clothes. You have to have a sunny day and the clothes dry. Or if you have breeze, the breeze will blow and dry them still. But we would love to have a dryer. That's basically what we would like right now. Yeah, yeah we well, we, one yesterday more. we have a meeting with Miss Perkins and I tell her that we don't need a smaller machine to do small loads because like the doctor clothes are them going out clothes we don't want to mix them up we want to. but if we mix them in the bungalow that we get we're not going to know them unless there are names on it yeah. My name is Lamar Wallace I'm a CP here as a child property one here on the other end. Yeah, like we, we, we patrol the property. Make sure it's everything in place. The body now and do the items. Secret words are as you do. Nice. It's nice working here, you know. I learn every day, you know. See a resident. Everybody here can teach us something, I understand. I like my job, yeah, I'm not a problem with it. 
And I broke it. Again. Yes, what about challenges uh, at times? Depends. <laughs> you never know, be specific and say anything, yeah? It depends. <laughs> like sometimes when you wait to them need by them, etc. I understand. You know. have a time, yeah? They you know, say them act up, yeah? So they call them out for you to put them there. Sometimes you need uh, more than one guy. You have to be careful with this game. You can't have to do anything you like know, to make them feel like so. They attack them and fight them. You know. You can't have to do anything you know. like that. You know. Yeah, that's real. You understand? I make them have more fun there, you know, like more sports, you know, for them to go out and enjoy themselves, feel like, you know, give them more time to go out, you know, and last time, need more people. August gone, 11th of August gone, he's spent here. Alright, um, see that the resident, they are hygiene care and they take their medication and see that they are okay and if they're sick, they carry them to the hospital and stop. And then see that they get their meal on time and their medication on time. And no abusing, and you try to love them as your own. Mm -hmm. It can be challenging at times, you know, but it seems like our second home, our first home, can you spend more time here, more even your home. So you get to love it as time goes by. It's challenging, but you love it. Well, Sometimes, you know, it, with it, can work and you will have like a disagreement but you can work around it. So, you know? yeah, some of them have time, some of them will act up, but otherwise you can manage. This thing, um, some of the people who love them more, that's all. I want to say love them more as your own and just, just that. The greatest thing is love. So I'm Kayla Andre. I am the Acting Assistant Administrator at Jacob Sada Mustard Seed Communities and this is one of 13 homes in Jamaica. So Mustard Seed Communities started in 1978. Um, our founder, Monsignor Ram Kisun, saw the living conditions of the children in Mona. Hence, he saw they were impoverished, um, not going to school, without food. So he took in a few of them, rented somewhere, and they took in a few of them, and that's how it started. So it's a seed, hence the name Mustard Seed Community. So it started small and we have developed into many branches. So we are in countries like Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, we are in Zimbabwe, we are in Malawi. So at Jacob Salado, we have residents with mental and physical disabilities, including autism, schizophrenia, Down syndrome, mental retardation. Um, we have a few who are suffering from cerebral palsy as well. So 
Well, I started in 2007. We are 11 years old. We came about because most of our homes within Mosetti communities cater for children. And once the children age, they're inside the home as well. So Jacob Saddle was created for adults. So once they age, they will transfer. They will be transferred here where they will live out their lives. Hence, creating more spaces in those homes to take in other children from situations in communities, impoverished situations of persons who are being abandoned. Um, recently, we took in 15 babies from the hospital. They were abandoned. Um, so we constantly create space. So once the residents age and based on their disabilities in the other homes, they are transferred here upon reaching adults. So most of our residents are pretty much engaged in various activities. Um, we have those that work on the farm, so they'll assist in feeding the animals, taking them out to be grazed, and they'll assist in cleaning the greenhouses, in reaping the crops, in bringing the meat to the kitchen. We have those who work in the laundry, so they'll help the laundresses in folding the clothes. We have some of the boys who transport the dirty laundry to and from the laundry house, transport back the clean laundry to the cottages. We have those that assist in the kitchen, so they'll take down the meals for the other residents. They'll help to wash pots and pans, you name it. So their lives are pretty much engaged. We try to engage them as best as possible in daily activities. Definitely not. So the government gives us a stipend, or it's supposed to be at the end of each month, um, towards most of the wards that we got from them. But this much is like a quarter of the amount they fund to the government owns. So it's insufficient because at the end of the day, we still have to be begging, which is our mandate. We continue to ask for donation, solicit donation from all angles to provide food, clothing, toiletries, and uh, for medication. The challenges we face are um, acquiring some of the drugs because they are quite expensive and our medication bill currently is nearly over a million for the month just for this facility so you can consider the other 13 rooms. It's quite exorbitant. 90% of our, our residents are are on psychotic drugs and it's quite expensive so if we were being assisted by the government that would have um, covered some of the medical costs as well as food there we would like to increase um, their nutritional value and the meals that they're getting so we'd like to in add more fruits more vegetables more proteins you name it but we have to use what we have for right now so if we had extra um, support from the government then that will go towards food as well. Some residents, we have about one in two in ten who are regular visitors, so they come once a week. We have one person, she was here yesterday, she visits once a week. Um, there's another mother that visits once a month, so every first Tuesday she visits and she knows what the needs of her child are, so she will take those items for us. We have those about three other family members for different residents who visit on their birthdays. So that's once a year and then we have maybe a one or two that visits on a Christmas, but that's it. Most, most are abandoned, so we never see them, we don't know about them, they don't inquire about their children. So apart from financial aid and um, food, clothing and so on. I think visiting, um, interacting with these residents because they need love, they're human 
and they require attention and care. So with persons in and around the communities getting involved and being more aware of what we do here, um, they will feel more appreciative of life because they consider us to be their family. So having other persons coming in just to support, whether financially or not, to spend their time here and their talents, I'm sure we will be appreciative of that. We plan to accommodate at least 500 um, residents. Um, this is where they will live out their life. We plan to have a stadium where they can go for recreational activities, swimming, football, basketball, netball, um, snack shops, um, to increase their skills. We have residents who are interested in going back, going to college. We have one resident who started a book and she wants to complete that book. Um, so we're moving towards that. We also have one who has been doing IT and wants to continue in that course. So we're planning on sending her to the college. Um, for the future, self-sustainability, wherein we eat what we grow, grow what we eat. So most of what we use, we want to be able to farm it to provide for ourselves. We have various activities. Yesterday was our residence Christmas party where staff, all of us of staff contributed. They picked names for residents and they purchased gifts. So all the residents were presented with a hundred gifts. We treated them to special lunch. They had face painting, bounce about music, dancing. Um, from time to time we have football competitions. We're hoping to have one soon. And basically just enjoying each moment with them. We have other groups coming in to celebrate Christmas and New Year's with them in terms of um, sharing lunch as well as interactive activities. We conducted a few interviews from various individuals around the campus in an effort to explore the stigma attached to disabled adults by Jamaicans. Question 1. Did you know that at the age of 18, disabled individuals are no longer adequately supported by the Jamaican government? No. I believe it. I, I'm, I mean, I'm not aware of the extent of the lack of support, but I, what I see around me in terms of how disabled people, the difficult time they have, just generally accessing buildings, being able to have work, I believe, yes, that they're not supported properly. Question two. Do you think disabled adults are a strain on Jamaican society? No, because they're people. You can't just describe people as burdens like that. But I mean, you do have to take care of them, so I mean, it's hard, but we don't see the on society. I don't think so. No, I don't understand. Yes, they are. Partially, but I think we should still take care of them. Because they waste resources and they can't contribute to society, and it's like a waste of time, money, and effort. Yes, life is important, but at the same time, they're not doing anything. I, I, yeah, that question makes my skin um, crawl because we have this beautiful line in our anthem, right? Strengthen us the weak to cherish. And in some ways, our disabled brothers and sisters, I mean, I don't think they consider themselves less human, but they are the people who need our help. They need uh, a hand up to be able to take their rightful, it's their rightful place. It's a favor we do them in society. And so they're no, no, they're not a strain. In fact, if you know people who are challenged, you know, visually, many of them, um, physically, um, making making tremendous contributions to our economy because they've been allowed, because they've been given the opportunity to do so. So no, I don't consider them a strain at all. I think we're being foolish, wasting what they have to offer us. Question three. Do you think that Jamaica is accessible for disabled individuals? Not much because... Being as a, being as a driver, 
and seen the sidewalk not our uh, sidewalk of um, a channel for the same to, to have access to so I don't think so. What do you think? Oh uh, I I don't think so. Not really no. Not really no. 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 No, and, and, and what one of the a very simple thing, a very simple thing that yeah, man, is, is very upsetting to me is uh, sidewalk. So, so if you're disabled, first of all, we don't have sidewalks on so many of our roads, as if we don't have pedestrians in this country, right? And where we do have them, there are light posts in the middle of them. So here you are going along with your cane. Or if you do, you know you, you just or you if you have a wheelchair you just can't because we have a light post in the middle of the sidewalk. I don't know what what, what that's about what that's about. So I think that um, I, I, there's um, there's growth. You see supermarkets. You see mo more more and more buildings having ramps. Uh, more and more places having special arrangements for the, the, the physically disabled. But there's so much more we can do. Question four. Do you think that institutions like Campion and other schools make it easy for disabled individuals to get an education? Like they, they, they yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I think so because as a uh, disabled person here before and can kind of have a few rooms, you know, I mean, can take it to the cafeteria, to the classroom and in a school like camp and students, I, I see students that help students that cannot help themselves, for instance, kids break them food several times and kids help them to go to class or ever around, so I think yes. Campion, we don't really have... Well, depending on the disability, I think we can accommodate for because I know that there are people who are like physically mute in first form, and I think there's an there's an autistic child in one of the years. I'm not so sure, but we have we we accommodate for certain disabilities that people have, um, but things like um, being blind or deaf, I think we could try. I think. We could try, and we have a lot of donators, so I believe that, you know, if we, yeah. Okay. I think Campion does a decent job because it has some ramps around the place, but like, for example, the sixth form building, I don't think there's a ramp anywhere, so I don't really know how, like, for the front, the front entrance, how you can get in, so I wouldn't say easy, but I think they're doing a better job in a lot of places. I do uh, make it easier. I think you just mean do they make it easy? Do yeah. they make it so are the schools Possible. accessible? Yeah. Right. I think a school like Campion, what we've been doing over the years is as the need arises we respond. So so as we will get a student with a visual impairment, oh, so then we start thinking about what do we need to have in the library? What do we need to have audio books? Do we need it's not as if we're set up um, ready for anybody with any kind of disability. We respond. So if our, our students have hurt themselves, or a child has come to us who has um, who needs to be in a wheelchair, all of a sudden you see us putting in the ramps, right? Which is um, right. We're only responding incrementally as we need to. There's much more that our school needs to do to make sure that we're ready for um, people with with, with with challenge. Question five. Do you think that disabled adults, both mentally and physically disabled, should be allowed to occupy the workforce? Yes, if they can, if they can function as well as someone that's not disabled, then definitely. Okay, so they could be good at um, like computer, electronics and stuff instead of physical activities, say. Um, Yes, I do believe that they can work. They should work, but um, certain jobs just may not be possible for them to do. For example, a blind person can't be a pilot, if that makes sense. It all depends. Okay, I see blind people work. Those are the same people, guys. I live next door to the society for the blind. I see blind people do some stuff here for one day. Um, I have a friend that this year we have one feet and trust me, when he's driving, 
I can't tell. I went into a taxi and I saw a disabled man. I saw a, 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 a taxi driver was disabled and it kind of surprised because he actually used a stick to press gas and brake and I just I, 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 I was just praying to reach my stop. <laughs> so, yes. Yes. They certainly should. They certainly should. Um, as I said, I've seen examples. I mean, I know um, brilliant people who have serious um, visual impairment uh, um, confined to wheelchairs. Absolutely nothing wrong with their minds and their ability to think and their ability to contribute. Artists you know, who have challenges. And the other thing is that what we regard as some of these challenges that are mental, maybe I'm not, I'm not using the language accurately, but I know that there are people who learn differently and who have different ways of thinking, um, of processing information. And I, I, I feel that all of those people have a place and a role um, and a capacity to contribute to to our, to our society. We just have to find the opportunity for them, give them the opportunity. Donate. Why should you donate? There's a lot that can be done and should be done because despite the many challenges and obstacles they face in their day-to-day -day life, they can still rise beyond their disability, but only with your help.